Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and welcome to Biology Essentials video number five. This is on the essential characteristics and how they're conserved. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about life. Uh, this right here is a tree of life, a circular tree of life, and you can see that this tree of life is going to branch over to here. These would be like the archaea, um, these would be the eukarya, uh, we would be, humans would be right here, if I can read that right. Uh, these are going to be the bacteria that go over here. And so we have this tree of life that tells us a few things. Number one, we're re more related uh, to archaea than we are to bacteria. Um, but it also shows that there are certain characteristics that are shared by all of life. In other words, all of life has DNA. And so that must have originated very early in this tree of life. And so today, what I'm going to talk about are essential, are essentially um, characteristics, essential characteristics. In other words, things that are required for life and how they're conserved or how they stick around um, through time. Uh, if we kind of plan this out, uh, I, this is what I want to talk about. I want to talk about three things and how they're conserved. Uh, the first one would be the genetic code, and that's DNA. Uh, next thing is the central dogma, and that's uh, how DNA eventually makes um, RNA and how RNA make proteins and then make you. And then some metabolic pathways. Uh, metabolism is the sum of all chemical reactions inside life. And there are some really fundamental things that you may not know that are found within these three groups. So these would be the three domains. We call that bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And so all life fits into one of these three categories. And so these three things are conserved or found in all of life. We'll also find that we move up that tree a little bit when we get to the eukaryotes. There are going to be characteristics that are shared within them as well. Uh, and so as we go farther and farther and farther up that uh, tree of life, we find more and more characteristics and, and we get finer and finer detail as we move our, our way up. So uh, let me quit talking about what I'm going to talk about and actually do it. Let's start with the first one, and that is the genetic code, and that is DNA. So you should be familiar with this, that double helix structure. Um, most people know what DNA is, but they don't necessarily know what it does. Um, a, an example would be this, uh, a jellyfish right here. Scientists were able to take a, a gene out of a jellyfish that makes a glowing protein that allows that jellyfish to do well deep in the ocean. Uh, they were able to take that DNA and put it into a bacteria. This is a really cool picture. It's a petri dish where a scientist put different genes inside the bacteria to make them glow. In this case, it's making it grow, glow this kind of a, a, a green color. We've also been able to put it inside fish and make fish that glow green. And so the genetic code is found in all of life. In other words, it's universal. We've never found anything that doesn't use uh, DNA as its genetic material or RNA, uh, if we talk about viruses. And so this is found in all of life. And it's also interchangeable, which is cool. We can take the DNA back out of here, put it in here, put it back. In. We can put it anywhere. And DNA is going to be universal. And so that suggests that all life uh, comes from this one common ancestor. Next thing is the idea of uh, the central dogma. Central dogma, you may not be familiar with that, but you should know what it is. Um, Watson and Crick were the people who got credit for um, discover discovering the structure of DNA. But this guy right here, Francis Crick, spent the next then uh, 10 years figuring out, well, the machinery behind the DNA, and so what it actually does. And so he, he summarized it right here. And so essentially what happens is DNA can copy itself. We call that DNA replication. It then, through transcription, makes RNA. RNA makes proteins, and a protein eventually uh, makes you. And so every part of you is made up of proteins and the result of protein action. And so um, all life goes through this same mechanism. In other words, in bacteria, they have the genetic material as DNA. They make RNA out of it, and then they make pro proteins. Now, the way that they do that, the uh, ribosomes that they use are a little bit different, but the mechanism is, is going to be exactly the same. And so we've never found life that doesn't uh, utilize this central dogma. Remember, you pass your DNA on, and then the cycle can begin uh, again. And the last one is metabolism. Metabolism, remember, is how we kind of make use of the energy that we're, that's given to us. And so it summarizes it here. In other words, we as humans and fungi and, and 
and a lot of bacteria, can take in organic material and oxygen. Uh, we then make carbon dioxide and water. This is called cellular respiration. And then there are certain producers that can actually make that again. Whereas plants are making sugars so they can actually break it down. But regardless of all of that, there are a few things that are found in all living organisms. And so if you know what DNA is, and you know that all life has it, you should also realize that this is the coinage, the energy coinage that all life uses as well. And so if I ever heard that we discovered life on some other planet, I want to know what's the hereditary material and then what is it, how is it making its energy? What's it using for metabolism? And so the fundamental ways that we utilize energy or get energy and make ATP is through glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. So all life uses one of those and either anaerobic or aerobic respiration. And so bacteria, fungi, whatever, we're making ATP and we're using the same fundamental metabolic pathways. And what does that suggest, going way back to that tree of life, that it originated very early in the life uh, uh, on our planet and it's been passed down uh, through time. But we'll get more into detail on, on respiration photosynthesis a little bit later. Now, if we go to the next group, um, so remember we have, if I were to sketch it out, we have the break off of bacteria domain. We also have the branching off of archaea, these ancient life. And then finally we have eukarya. And that's what you are. And actually everything on here, from animals all the way over to fungi, down in here to unicellular organism and plants and all these things are eukaryotes. Now they are a different kind of a cell. And so what do you know about a eukaryote? It actually, if I remember right, karyo comes from egg. And so the best way to think about um, a eukaryotic cell is that it has a nucleus. So it has a nuclei on the inside where it stores its DNA. But how did we go from these simple cells to cells that are eukaryotic and have a division of labor inside the cell itself. Well, there's actually two ways that we did that and two characteristics that I chose to talk about related to eukaryotes tell us how we got there. So let me clear that off and get to the endomembrane system. And so the first way that cells move from very simple cells to more complex cells, well, if you think about it, let's say I have one cell, this is really simple, but how can I make that more complex? Well, a really simple way to make that complex is to have it fold in on itself. And if I have it fold in on itself, now I have an increase in surface area and, and so I can, I can do other jobs. And so we have a number of things. So you know the Golgi apparatus, endoplasmic reticulum, lysosomes, vesicles, all these things are made, we think, from the infolding of this what's called the endomembrane system or a membrane on the inside. Now what's interesting is that we can actually look at proteins on the outside of the cell and proteins on the inside of the cell. Oops, let me go back for a second. And proteins on the inside of the cell and we find that they'll actually be reversed. In other words, ones that on the outside of the cell will now be, let me get this right, on the outside of this and vice versa here. So we also have some strong molecular evidence as well to show that this infolding has occurred. And so that's a common characteristic, this endomembrane system of all eukaryotic cells. And then another example would be uh, organelles themselves. The two specific ones that I'd like to talk about are the mitochondria, which we use to get energy out of our uh, food to do oxidative phosphorylation and get as much ATP as we can. And then the chloroplast, which is used in plants and a lot of photosynthesis synthetic eukaryotes to actually take energy from the sun and then use that to fix carbon. Now what's interesting about these two is that they are not formed, we don't think, by an infolding of the membrane. They're not part of that endomembrane system, so that's not them. These actually were formed by endosymbiosis, and so what we think is that the um, Mitochondria was a bacteria once on its own. It was living in close proximity to these early eukaryotic cells and then eventually started living inside. And so it's actually a cell within a cell. Now, what kind of evidence do we have? Because that seems crazy that this is actually occurring. Well, if you look inside here, we actually have DNA inside of mitochondria. And, and so they're actually reproducing by binary fission on their own, and they have a lot of properties that are very similar to um, bacteria. And we think chloroplasts got into plant cells in the same exact way. And so they're kind of hijacking or living inside of us at this time. So it's a cool way that we can get complex eukaryotes. Uh, and so those are some common characteristics of um, 
of eukaryotes. And I guess the whole general point of this video podcast is that if you come up with a solution, that solution is going to be passed up the tree of life. There's no way to, we could step back and say, hey, let's find a new genetic information. Let's use something else. That decision was made billions of years ago. And so I hope that's helpful.